This is a complete and working AMD QuantFX system. But to better understand just what this is, why it exists, and why very few people know of the existence of this platform, we need to go back in time a bit. To be more precise, we need to go back to 2006, which was an interesting year for AMD. You see, for the past few years before that, AMD had been quite successful with their line of Athlon 64 and dual-core Athlon 64 X2 CPUs, which competed against Intel's counterparts with the Pentium 4 and dual-core Pentium D. And now the Athlon 64 X2, although more expensive compared to the Pentium D, was the faster chip and put Intel in a difficult position with their relatively lackluster netburst CPUs. But all of that was to change in March 2006 at the Intel Developers Forum, where Intel showed off their new Conroe architecture with the Core 2 Duo line of CPUs. These Core 2 Duo chips featured a completely overhauled architecture and were manufactured on 65 nanometers. In one go, they would take away AMD's leading position in performance and power efficiency. Even worse for AMD, Intel was to double down on that performance lead, as they also showed off Kensfield, the first consumer quad-core CPU, consisting of two Convo dies, and they named it the Core 2 Quad. Now at the time, AMD was still over a year away from launching their own quad-core, based on their new K10 architecture. But for now, they couldn't just sit around and watch Intel beat them to the quad-core race. So they had to get creative and find a way to respond to Core 2 Quad. And that response came at the end of November 2006, less than a month after Intel released Core 2 Quad. And what AMD had come up with was pretty interesting. You see, AMD was still on 90 nanometers at the time, and their best CPU, the FX62, was a dual core at 2.8 GHz with a 125 watt TDP. Now turning that into a quad core wouldn't have turned out very pretty. However, with some creative thinking, AMD went, well, why not give the consumer two dual cores instead? So they went into their newly released Socket F Opteron, grabbed the highest binned dual core Opterons, and created three new Athlons the FX70, FX72, and then these. The King of the Hill 3 GHz FX74, the highest clocked dual-core Athlon at the time. Now these were LGA chips because they were just practically Opterons, unlike the PGA Athlons at the time for the consumers. But then AMD also needed a suitable dual-socket motherboard for this platform. And for that, they went to ASUS, who came up with this, the L1N64 SLI WS Quadfather Megatasking Motherboard. Now, it should be noted, in the early stages, this platform was known as the 4X4 platform, but later it was changed and referred to as both the Quadfather and QuadFX platform. Well, this example is in truly exceptional shape, really, everything is still like new, some things have never been used. So first we'll do a bit of an unboxing, go over what is included, then the details of the motherboard, and then we'll set it up for Windows and do some gaming as well. Starting with the front of the box, and here we have a large image of the quad father smoking a cigar. On the bottom left we have the Athlon 64 FX and Nvidia SLI logos, on top there is the all-important Windows Vista support. And on the right that this board was meant for not just multitasking, but megatasking, for getting even more things done at the same time. On the bottom we have the same L1 and 64 logo, and yet again megatasking. Moving to the left side, and there is the mention of the quad father yet again. And on the right side, there's the sticker for the model and serial number. On the back of the board, we've got a nice image of the board detailing some of the features. Next up, we can actually open the front cover to reveal more information about the board. 
On the left it is shown using different kinds of logos. And on the right there is a list with more detailed information. But I'll go into more detail when I unbox the board. With the outer sleeve removed, it's time to open up the box itself. Starting with the two plastic cases for the FX74s and the protectors for the CPU sockets. Next we have some very unique stickers with the Athlon FX and SLI logo and DSDC, standing for Dual Socket Direct Connect Architecture. This Direct Connect Architecture was a staple of AMD's Optor Online at the time. Unlike Intel's Frontside Bus, where the CPUs are connected via a central memory controller hub, with AMD's Direct Connect Architecture and the Hyper Transport System Bus, multiple CPUs can be directly connected together and CPUs are connected directly to memory and I.O. In the case of QuadFX, this is between two Athlon FX's, but in Opteron form this can be up to four sockets. Moving on to more stickers, and here are two silver Athlon 6.4 FX stickers, and a nice old school powered by ASUS one. Then we have the driver DVD here, again for the megatasking motherboard, including Windows Vista drivers. Next up is the user guide, which is quite thick and very comprehensive overall. Then there are two sets of Molex to SATA power adapters, and a total of four SATA cables, one of which is still unused. Moving on to two unused ASUS branded parallel ATA cables. Then, interestingly also still sealed, the front panel connectors. This board really must not have had a lot of use in its life. Then, also a standard brown-orange SLI bridge. And, curiously, not one but two IO shields. Now, this is very cool. Here are four unused, still in their bags, special ASUS cooling fans for the Southbridge and VRM heatsinks. In total, three are needed for this motherboard, but it's very cool to still see them in place, and the fact that there are four instead of just three. And lastly, a four-port USB 2.0 expansion for the back of the case. And with that, it's about time to unbox the motherboard itself. Let's go over the board in more detail. Starting with the PCIe situation, as this board features four PCI X16 slots. Now in 2006 this was very uncommon. Two of those four slots are wired by X16 and two are wired by X8. There's also one PCI X1 slot and a legacy PCI slot. Now to make this all work, they brought in not one, but two NVIDIA Enforce 680A SLI chips, which reside under this thick copper heatsink. Each of these are connected to an X16 and an X8 PCIe slot, and SLI and Crossfire are both supported. Also connected up to these are 12 SATA 2 3 gigabits a second ports, which was about double the amount offered on most high-end motherboards back then. It's also worth noting the unfortunate placement of the 24-pin power connector. Looking at the rear I.O. we find dual gigabit Ethernet, perhaps disappointingly only four USB 2 ports, a printer port, eSATA, SPDIF and TOSLink out, PS2 keyboard and mouse, and various audio outs and a microphone port. Moving on to the memory, we have four slots of DDR2 in total, two for each CPU. This platform has non-unified memory access, with both CPUs having their own memory controller. Like mentioned uh, with the Direct Connect architecture, can, CPUs can access each other's RAM via the hypertransport link. Here we're running the maximum support of 8GB of dual channel in total, using 4 sticks of 2GB a Pacer DDR2800 CL5. It's time to move up to the CPU area. With the coolers removed, we can have a look at both of the LGA sockets. In Opteron form, these are called Socket F, but for this platform they were known as Socket 1207FX, or Socket L1, 
Hence the name of the motherboard L1N64. As mentioned in the intro, AMD created three CPUs for this platform, starting with the 2.6 GHz FX70, then the 2.8 GHz FX72, and at the top of the range the 3 GHz FX74, all with 2 MB of L2 cache total and a 125 watt TDP. What was unique about these is that they were only sold in pairs, ranging from $599 for two FX70s all the way up to $999 for two FX74s. And if we compare that to AMD's previous best, the 2.8 GHz FX62 on the AM2 socket, the 74 now became the fastest consumer AMD CPU available. As mentioned in the intro here, I've got two of the flagship FX74s for a total of four cores at 3 GHz at stock. Let's get them installed into the board. For now we're running the stock coolers, and while they are adequate, they certainly don't offer much for OC headroom. At the top of the board there's the VRM setup with eight phases for each CPU, and each with their own copper heatsink. It's time to get the special fans installed on all three heatsinks for the board. Now ASUS says that these should only be installed if you're running passive or water cooling to ensure stability. However, this board runs very, very warm, so I have opted to install them. Now it's just a matter of plugging in the 24-pin and EPS 8-pin connectors. For testing, I'm using this ASUS Matrix HD 7970 Platinum I featured recently, and this should be plenty fast for this setup. Time to fire it up. What I found surprising is just how easy the overall setup was. I simply installed the latest Windows 10 Professional via USB on a 120 gig SATA 3 SSD, and everything installed automatically and without any driver issues, despite the age and complexity of this system. Here you're watching Windows 10 boot in real time, and it reaches the desktop in 26 seconds. Here you can see it's running Windows 10 Professional 64-bit with dual Athlon 6.4 FX74s and 8GB of installed memory. And here Task Manager is showing the two sockets, four cores and a total of 4MB of L2 cache. And of course CPU-Z. Now I did have to manually set the voltage in the BIOS at 1.375 volts but other than that it was pretty much ready to go. Going back to how easy the setup was, that was also the general impression I got from just regularly using this system, apart from gaming, to which we'll get to shortly. In most scenarios it was still perfectly usable, and if, say, I was presented with this system not knowing how old it was, I probably would not have guessed from just using it that it was 14 years old already as in most cases it's still perfectly fine. As for a quick rendering test, here we have Cinebench R15, and here the dual FX74s at 3 GHz come in at 256 points. Now that's not an awful lot for modern standards. AMD's current cheapest Athlon, the Athlon 200GE, comes here at 360 points with the 12-core Ryzen 9 3900X being over 12 times faster here. On the single-threaded test, we can really see the age of these CPUs, as a single-threaded score of 63 points isn't a whole lot. For comparison, the Athlon 200GE scores about double that, and the high-end AMD Ryzen or Core i9 CPUs score more than triple the amount of points here. And now for the question of gaming. Here running GTA 5 at 1080p with the normal preset, and it's surprisingly playable, hovering around 30fps most of the time, 
with actually quite reasonable frame times and few jarring frame time spikes. All four cores are utilized at around 100% most of the time. Overall, I would say Quantifex does deliver quite a playable experience in GTA V, surprisingly. Next up for something rather more challenging. Here we have Battlefield 1, 32 player multiplayer, running at 1080p with the low preset. Now here we can really see the CPU struggling, as 30fps can't be maintained even in very good scenarios. Like in GTA 5, all cores are maxed out most of the time here, and RAM usage is also over 5GB. In intensive scenes it does drop below even 20 FPS, although it must be said it was pretty stable FPS wise and it didn't really have any major hiccups. However, considering that Battlefield 1 was released 10 years after Quad FX, if we keep that in mind, I would say it's actually quite impressive the way it runs it. And there we have it the AMD Quad FX platform revisited in 2020. Now at the start of the video I asked three questions. What is it? Why does it exist? And now lastly, why don't we remember this? Why do we remember Core 2 Quad but not Quad FX? And the answer to that is pretty simple. And that performance just wasn't very good compared to Core 2 Quad. In multi-threaded applications it managed to eke out a few wins, but overall Core 2 Quad was just faster. And when it came to gaming it had trouble just being faster than the old FX6 II, and the Core 2s they were just off in the distance. Now all of that wouldn't have been much of a problem if it was cheap, or at least cheaper than Core 2, but it wasn't. It was an expensive platform, you had two CPUs, you had a large motherboard, it was expensive. Especially when in 2007 Intel came out with a cheaper core to quad, the legendary Q6600. What also didn't help matters is that it consumed lots and lots of power. Compared to a core to quad extreme it used over 70% more power at load and that just did not help matters. And as a result this platform only ended up selling in very limited numbers because unless you just really disliked Intel there wasn't much point in buying a Quad FX. And that was a shame, because AMD had great plans for this platform. There would be new versions of it in the following years with two Quad Cores and DDR3. And of course there would be more motherboards for it and there would be a CPU upgrade path for existing Quad FX users. In fact in 2007 they announced the Fascinate, which was going to feature two Phenom Quad Core processors for a total of 8 cores. However, later that same year it turned out that the 8-core Fascinate would not enter production and that there likely wouldn't be a clear upgrade path for current QuadFX users either. In the end, the L1N64 SLI WS would be the only board released and the FX70, 72 and 74 would end up being the only CPUs. And with AMD out of the Enthusiast dual socket market, they then left the door wide open for Intel to come in. In 2007 they had already showed off their V8 platform, which would be 8 cores on a consumer or a prosumer platform. And in 2008 they released it with Skulltrail. And that really was the end of QuadFX. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have, please leave a comment and a like. And if you want to keep kept up to date on future projects, why don't consider subscribing? Well, this was all for now and bye bye.